On this slide, I've summarized the changes that you see in a patient who has acute respiratory failure. And these are the same changes that you see in a patient who is failing a weaning trial. So whether we have somebody failing a weaning trial or we have somebody coming into the emergency room who is in acute respiratory failure, this is the type of pathophysiology that you see. Then when you take a patient like that and you connect the patient to the ventilator, the primary goal of placing the patient on the ventilator is to rest the respiratory muscles. The interaction between the rhythm of the patient's respiratory centers and the ventilator is the key determinant of how much rest that the patient will receive. During assist control ventilation, Jean Marini showed that the work of breathing was decreased into the normal range in only about half the patients. And that in some patients, the work can even be higher on the ventilator than during spontaneous breathing. So in acute respiratory failure, before the patient is placed on the ventilator, on average, the inspiratory pressure is increased about five-fold above the normal range. Also, the expiratory muscles are commonly recruited. So what are the mechanisms that determine good synchronization between the patient and the machine, the ventilator, that will be necessary to ensure satisfactory rest of the respiratory muscles? If these settings on the ventilator are optimal, the inspiratory pressure generation will be markedly decreased. It will be just about enough to trigger the ventilator and to avoid respiratory muscle deconditioning. Also, the expiratory muscle activity will be ablated. So this optimal scenario is not always achieved. Problems can arise with patient ventilator asynchrony at three different points. At the time of triggering, during the time of flow de delivery, during the inflation phase, and also at the switchover between the end of mechanical inflation and the beginning of the expiratory phase. I will show you examples of the problems that are can arise at each of these three different points. In the next series of slides, I'm going to show you a series of slides of how we calculate the work of breathing during ventilator triggering. Here we see the esophageal pressure, which is shown in white, and work of breathing is going to be the difference between the esophageal pressure and the chest wall <coughs> recoil line, which is the dotted blue line. The effort of triggering is divided into two phases. The trigger phase is the time between the onset of patient effort until the onset of flow delivery, when the ventilator valve first opens. This amount of work is shown in green. The post-trigger phase is the period from the onset of flow delivery to the switch between the inspiratory flow and expiratory flow. This amount of work is shown in orange. In an assisted mode of mechanical ventilation, a patient depends on an adequate respiratory motor output to generate inspiratory efforts, which trigger the ventilator. One of our former fellows, Phil Leong, showed that the magnitude of a patient's respiratory output at the onset of a breath, as quantified by DPDT, that's the change in pressure to change in time, which our chairman pointed out, is very similar to the P100. And so this is the same type of measurement. And this is a major determinant of the inspiratory work 
performed after triggering, which is here quantified as the pressure time product following triggering. And that is, once the patient has triggered the machine, he or she does not switch off his or her respiratory motor output. The amount of respiratory motor output at the onset of the triggered breath determines how much or how little rest the ventilator is capable of achieving. If the respiratory motor output at the point of triggering is important, then intuitively you would expect that patient effort during triggering would be an important determinant of the patient effort during the remainder of inflation. Here we see the progressive increase in pressure support led to a fourfold decrease in patient effort as reflected by a decrease in the pressure time product. Yet the patient effort during the time of triggering remained constant. So this is kind of puzzling why this happened. And the constancy of the pressure time product during triggering was the result of two determinants of effort that were moving in opposite directions as the pressure support was being increased. At a low level of pressure support, respiratory drive was high, but the triggering time was short, and this resulted in a large change in esophageal pressure over a short period of time. At a high level of pressure support, the respiratory drive was low, but the triggering time was long, and this resulted in a small change in esophageal pressure over a longer period of time. Another common problem with mechanical ventilation is failure to trigger. In this particular patient receiving pressure support, we see that he made three unsuccessful efforts before he was successful in triggering the machine. At high levels of assistance, such as in chronic ventilated patients, about 30% of inspiratory attempts will fail to trigger the machine. So to determine the pathophysiological mechanisms of failure to trigger, we looked at the characteristics of the breaths before the non-triggering attempts and the triggering attempts. Breaths before the non-triggering attempts, shown here in orange, we can see that they had a higher tidal volume, they also had a shorter expiratory time, and the higher tidal volume with the shorter expiratory time gave less time for the exhalation to occur, and this as a result resu resulted in a higher elastic recoil, which we typically measure as intrinsic peak. So as such, the true triggering threshold is much higher because it's the intrinsic peak rather than the set sensitivity on the ventilator. So these unsuccessful triggering attempts resulted in wasted efforts, which we quantified as follows. Again, the continuous tracing on the bottom curve is the esophageal pressure. The dotted blue line is the patient's chest wall recoil pressure, which we measured separately during controlled ventilation. And then the red and the yellow is what I had shown you previously as how we quantified work of breathing during the triggered breaths. <coughs> the orange shading that you see here is the area that occurs between the commencement of the fall in esophageal pressure, which is the yellow vertical line, until the uh, red uh, dotted vertical line indicating the switchover between inspiratory and expiratory flow. And this is your measure of the wasted effort. At, at the level of pressure support and IMV were increased we found that the wasted pressure time product increased significantly. The presence of non-triggering can be a signal that too much volume is being delivered to the patient. 
So decreasing the level of pressure support can eliminate the wasted efforts. But that has to be balanced by the inevitable increase in the total inspiratory effort, which may be sufficient to hinder recovery of the respiratory muscles. Thiel and Burchard found that 24% of patients had at least 10% of respiratory efforts that were non-triggered, and that the duration of mechanical ventilation was longer in the patients with a high rate of non-triggering. It may seem strange that non-triggering would influence the duration of mechanical ventilation. Here we see non-triggering during mechanical exhalation. During mechanical exhalation, the diaphragm is being lengthened. And so triggering during exhalation causes what are called eccentric muscle contractions. Eccentric or plyometric muscle contractions are known to cause muscle damage, as shown here by the streaming and broadening of the Z bands and uh, as contrasted with what you see in the normal EMG. Thus, non-triggering can cause damage to the respiratory muscles, which will delay weaning and lead to prolongation of the period of mechanical ventilation. I showed you earlier how failure to trigger is related to a short expiratory time and also a high intrinsic peak. Theoretically, a higher inspiratory flow will shorten the inspiratory time and thus may prolong the expiratory time. But the effect of inspiratory flow is complex on patient-ventilator interaction. Pudi and Eunice have shown that an increase in flow causes an instantaneous increase in respiratory frequency. And in studying patient ventilator interaction, a problem arises in that it's not possible to study the effects of an increase in flow on their own, because an increase in flow must be accompanied by an increase in tidal volume or by a decrease in inspiratory time. Franco Loggi in our group did a series of experiments to delineate out the separate influences of inspiratory flow, tidal volume, and ventilator inspiratory time on respiratory frequency. Firstly, like Magdi Yunus, he found that increases in flow produced an increase in respiratory frequency. But since the tidal volume was kept constant, the increase in flow, or VTTI, were accompanied by a proportional decrease in the inspiratory time. So here we see the data from the previous slide, and now they're replotted. And we can see that for different flow rates with a constant tidal volume, but with a varying inspiratory time, there is a close correlation between respiratory frequency and ventilator inspiratory time. When the flow and the tidal volume were kept constant and the tidal, the inspiratory time was altered by the addition of inspiratory pauses, again we can see there's a close correlation between the frequency and the ventilator inspiratory time. And in the last panel what we have is that the flow was increased from 30 to 60 and 90, but at each step, the tidal volume was increased so as to keep the inspiratory time constant. And uh, here we see that there was, uh, that the increase in flow from 30 to 60 actually caused a significant decrease in respiratory rate. So it's the imposed inspiratory time that is the major determinant of the changes in respiratory frequency that occurs. That, that is the crucial determinant, more so than the patient's actual 
respiratory rate. In COPD, a major reason to increase the inspiratory flow is in an attempt to shorten the inspiratory time and thus to allow more time for exhalation and so to allow for and achieve a lower auto peak or intrinsic peak. But if the increase in flow as I showed you is going to cause an increase in frequency then it's possible that expiratory time will actually shorten more as a result of increasing the flow and so you may get a further increase in the intrinsic peak. Again, Franco Loggi and our group studied this question in patients with COPD. And again, as in the healthy subjects, an increase in flow from 30 to 60 caused an increase in the respiratory rate. But despite the increase in rate, the intrinsic PEEP did not increase. In fact, it fell. And the reason that it fell was because the increase in flow was accompanied by an increase in the expiratory time, leaving more time for exhalation, and so allowing the intrinsic peep to fall. So why did the expiratory time increase in these patients? An increase in inspiratory flow is achieved by shortening of the mechanical inspiratory time. And the shortened in mechanical inspiratory time combined with the time constant inhomogeneity of COPD will cause overinflation of some lung units to persist into neural expiration. And then continued inflation of the, those units during neural expiration will cause stimulation of the vagus nerve. And it's the stimulation of the vagus nerve that causes the prolongation of the expiratory time. And here we see tracings in one patient. And it's best if you look at these tracings going from the right to the left, the reverse of how you normally look at it, going from 30 to 60 and 90 flow rate. And you can see that as the flow rate was increased that the swings in esophageal pressure decrease as does the amount of intrinsic peak. And the higher flow rate also caused a decrease in the chest volume, indicating a decrease in hyperinflation and intrinsic PEEP in terms of the end expiratory lung volume. And the main reason then that the increase in flow causes a decrease in intrinsic PEEP is because of the increase in expiratory time. The third point that problems of patient-ventilator interactions can arise is at the switchover between inspiration and expiration. Pressure support operates whereby that the inspiratory assistance ceases when flow decreases from the peak down to about 25% of the peak flow. It varies differently on different ventilators, but generally it follows a principle similar to this. In patients with COPD who have a prolonged time constant, more time will be required to achieve this switch over threshold. And the expiratory neurons will then become impatient and they'll start to fire and cause contraction of the expiratory muscles while the ventilator is still attempting to inflate the respiratory system. So we first became aware of this problem by looking at the contour of the esophageal pressure in patients receiving pressure support. We found the contour very strange and wondered what was the reason for this particular contour. We then related the esophageal pressure to the calculated values of the chest wall recoil pressure. And you see them here. And about halfway during inflation, you can see that the esophageal pressure is higher than the chest wall recoil, indicating that the respiratory muscles have become recruited. And to obtain more direct evidence of this, uh, we, one of our fellows, Sai Partha, uh, inserted a 
electrodes into the expiratory muscles and we can see here that about halfway during the phase of inflation that there is activity of the transverses abdominis. So this is fighting the ventilator which is clearly undesirable uh, in a patient who is receiving mechanical ventilation. Another factor that adds to the complexity of patient ventilator interaction is the effect of sleep. Again, in this study by uh, Sai Partha Sarata, uh, one of our former fe fellows, he studied the interaction between ventilator modes and sleep in 11 critically ill patients. Here we see the polysomographic uh, tracings in two patients, one receiving pressure support and then while receiving uh, assist control. And here we see the different uh, placement of the electrodes for performing the uh, polysomogram, so on the EEG and the electrooculograms and the chin and leg EMGs. And then here we see that during pressure support that the patient had three central apneas. But with the backup rate as set during assist control, this prevented the apneas from occurring. All of the 11 patients achieved sleep, and of the 11 patients, six of them developed apneas during pressure support, but none of them, of course, developed apneas during assist control by virtue of the backup rate. The tidal volume was 8 ml per kilogram during assist control, and pressure support was titrated to achieve the same tidal volume. So as such, the apneas during pressure support were not the result of the tidal volume that the patients were receiving during the pressure support. The addition of dead space, which causes an increase in PCO2, and in our patients increased the PCO2 by 4.3 millimeters of mercury, this caused a decrease in the number of apneas from 53 per hour down to 4 per hour. So we then measured sleep fragmentation, which is simply the sum of arousals plus awakenings during a, a 30 second sleep epoch. And the sleep fragmentation was greater during the pressure support as compared with assist control with 79 arousals and awakenings versus 54 with assist control. Sleep efficiency, which is the time that a patient was asleep, divided by the duration of the study, and the duration of these studies was set at two hours, was 75% during assist control compared with 63% during uh, pressure support. Most of the disturbed sleep during pressure support was related to the development of central sleep apneas in the patients receiving the pressure support. The addition of dead space in these patients caused an increase in the PCO2, as I said, of 4.3, and this caused a decrease in the apneas from 53 apneas per hour down to 4 apneas, and it also caused a decrease in the number of arousals and awakenings from 79 down to 44. So changes in the sleep-wake state have very important implications for how a physician sets the ventilator. <coughs> Physicians typically adjust the ventilator settings during the daytime without knowing whether the patient is asleep or awake. So compared with the awake state, sleep lowers the respiratory rate by 33% during pressure support, and by 15% during assist control. And it raises the PCO2 by 11% during pressure support, and sleep raised the PCO2 by 5% during assist control. So if you adjust the pressure support according to the respiratory rate while the patient is asleep, at which point the respiratory rate will be low. Then, on awakening, the increase in patient rate may cause a considerable increase in the effort that the patient is performing. So, in conclusion, 
the interaction between a patient and a ventilator is quite complex, being dependent on synchronization of the rhythm produced by the patient's respiratory centers and the cycling of a machine. Given that the primary reason that mechanical ventilation is instituted, which is to rest the respiratory muscles, physicians need to be skilled in the adjustment of ventilator settings in order to achieve optimal synchronization. But although these adjustments are made manually, the critical skill is cognitive. It's the application of sophisticated knowledge of applied physiology at the bedside. Thank you.